Hey, it's Friday, April 26th, about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Four days after the uh, full moon on the 23rd, which was preceded, of course, by a new moon that eclipsed the sun. And I just happened to be in Mexico to see it. There's already a video on the Astronomical Threat playlist capturing that event to the degree that we were able to image it with the limited equipment had at the time. But at least you will get a little background or as to our trip. What you're seeing now is the Gemini, uh, Mosman D Gemini 2 mount being prepped to receive the six inch Skywatcher telescope. The observatory has basically been cleared. I noticed a few wasps winging their way about it. Uh, this is a very nice spot for them to set up their little wasps' nests in the springtime. So I'll have to pay attention to that in the future. Oh, you can see why. There. So with the next step for me, you'll notice the electronics is missing that has to come in and the scope is missing. The mount should be pretty much in the same location it was previously, which did a pretty good job of aligning the Polaris, although I'll probably have to make some more mechanical adjustments. Anyway, Penti is now available and ready to receive its telescopic inheritance. Okay, I just walked the Skywatcher out, mounted it in its cradle on the Lasman D. You'll notice this little rubber band here. I put that there so it would give me an approximate alignment of where the scope is perfectly balanced when all the equipment, such as the finder scope, the display screen for the uh, video, the inch and a quarter diagonal, when all of that is on the scope, the scope should be perfectly balanced on the what, is, what would be considered the equi uh, let's see that would be the equatorial axis there actually no it would be on the declination axis because the scope will swing like this but yes it's both balanced equatorially and on the declination axis so there's our view backing out a lot of assembly still remains to be done. One of the things I'll have to do, however, is close up one of Penny's um, lift ties in order to keep the sun off the black scope. Okay, down below here on the deck are a few of the items I'm gonna have to mount to the scope. There won't be any eyepieces. There won't be any Shorty Barlow. There will be inch and a quarter diagonal. There will be the Rev2 imaging camera, CCD imager with cabling. There will be the display, a finder scope, controller for the mount, and a hand controller to feed into the controller of the mount. There may be a few other items as I go along, but let's start with these. Here I've started with a TFT color monitor. Uh, it'll be adjustable in position because I want to get the best possible contrast to the whole screen, but I can't determine that until I'm actually feeding mounted the camera that will be used to monitor the screen and also to receive my verbal description and backgrounding of whatever we happen to be seeing on the screen at a time or perhaps even more uh, lofty abstract concepts, which I tend to do in my videos, especially in my captioning. Just mounted the finder scope, which barely manages to look past both the monitor and the cinch uh, on the cradle there, but it does well enough. I rarely, actually never actually use the internal illumination for the uh, finder scope crosshairs. I'll probably rotate it out of the way. It's going to take a good deal of setup and I'll have to do that using a physical target which will be somewhere up on the hillside and that'll be later on after I get it together. Ooh, got a bit of a winged friend up there. Zooming in. Gone! Probably a turkey vulture. I didn't see much in the way of the wings flapping. The inch and a quarter diagonal will be incorporated with a Lumicon deep sky filter. We do get a lot of atmospheric vapor here in the John Day Valley off the mountains. Uh, there's one in particular over here. 
canyon now, which will probably be letting off. You can see some snow on it. We do have a river running through the valley, so that also lets off some humidity. Neighboring lights and the lights downtown, plus the ones at the airport above, can sometimes require some filterage. Thus, the little cut deep in the sky. The Rev2 comes with this programmable HD digital camera. I've been using it for almost two, probably more than two years now. And I've included the 0.5x Barlow because without it, we're operating at one millimeter exit pupil, which effectively reduces the deep sky reach of the six inch to that of roughly a 12 inch telescope. And I personally prefer, and also reduces the field of view down to about 10 by seven arc minutes, which is very small. Perfectly fine for planetary observation. One millimeter exit pupil gives you 0 0.8 arc seconds resolution with the 6 inch Skywatcher ED. However, for deep sky, you want to go 2 millimeter exit pupil, which at the most sensitive rating of this uh, uh, digital camera means that I can image galaxies down to about magnitude 17 to maybe 17.5 at 75x with a 10 by a 15 by 20 arc minute size field of view. Okay, while I could use the imaging system straight through, which would be ideal without the diagonal, the issue becomes a lack of space in the Penti Observatory. So I have to use the diagonal to be able to come to focus with the minimal amount of potential mechanical uh, contact between the telescope and the observatory itself. Not being a wireless setup, there's a lot of cabling that goes with the uh, Rev2 imaging system. You got power to the camera, 12 volts, you got an, uh, a feed that goes to the TFT monitor. The feed itself looks to me like it's a serial type feed. There's only two connections. There's a ground, there's a shield and there's a signal line. So it's probably some kind of uh, serial feed that goes to the TFT monitor itself. You got power that comes up to both the units, the imager and the display, as well as, uh, that looks like pretty much it. I think I've done a more elegant job of routing the cabling this time, but you never know until I swing the scope through its full work envelope. The Lasma ND controller has several ports on it. Auto guider, if you're doing long-term imaging. Port F, I'm not sure what it is. A serial and GPS port. If I had a GPS sensor, I could plug it in there. I do not have one. Hand controller, of course. And then there's the declination feed for the stepper motor. I believe it's a stepper motor. It could be a DC servo. And the right ascension. Power's off at this point. I won't turn it on until I've swung the scope through its work envelope, making sure that all the cabling does not interfere with itself or other items on the scope. I have one more installation to do, and that will be up top side here to mount a handy, uh, Sony Handycam for imaging what is displayed on the screen. So right now I'm going to swing the scope through its work envelope after loosening the clutches. One here on the right ascension, another here on the declination. Okay, having wired everything up and make sure the wiring would not get bungled during motion as well as having freedom of motion in the work envelope of the observatory with the south and the northeast facing roof tries open. I'm driving the scope to what is called the home position because up on the hilltop there's something I need to focus on in order to line up the finder scope for later views and it looks like it is pointing in the right direction but I should be ready to stall, stop this at any point if it gets weird and it didn't get weird. So everything at this point means that I should be able to just dial in the 
set point settings for the scope when I'm doing deep sky now that the moon has progressed. We've got the mount, should be aligned roughly, pretty close. We've got the mount controller, the hand controller, the scope booted up. Now one of the things that could have happened over time is the little uh, coin battery inside the Gemini 2 could have run down and I would have lost data associated with right, my location and the time. The time itself is off. I think we, I, I'm basically just leaving it year round at um, day, uh, standard time. I may have to adjust the time a little bit though because I have noticed there is drift over time. The one thing I screwed up is that in the park position counterweight down I should have my um, I should have my uh, balance on the other side of the scope. Right now it's to the back but I can use my little scale here, balance scale, to do both axes so I'm not too particularly concerned about it. Should have paid a little more attention to that. But now let's go ahead and see if we can focus on something on the hillside and set up the finder scope alignment with the main optical tube assembly. Okay, so at this point, I've got the CCD imager feeding a signal to the screen. I've got the finder scope lined up, although I may reorient it in the future for better ergonomics. I found the point of focus, at least for the hillside over there, it'll probably uh, shift slightly when I actually start imaging stars. I've got the dew cap on the end of the OTA assembly. The Skywatcher Evo Star 150 ED is ready to go. The mount itself is all set up and on returning to counterweight down position, I have this alignment on the bubble here and this alignment parallels the bubble here because if the scope were to tilt one way or the other, it would shift. So we now have a scope ready for final adjustments later on when the sky permits because the atmosphere, sky, rules all unless you're the James Webb Space Telescope. Then you only have to worry about impinging particles. But here we have bazillions of particles and sometimes they form clouds. Signing off until the next evening's observations. This is uh, Jeff. And I hope you've uh, enjoyed a review of how to set up the Lozman DG11 mount along with the Rev2 system and the telescopic assembly. Uh, carpe, not noctum, carpe diem.